Hey gang, welcome to week 6 of Code Club. Since you already know all the basic building blocks you need to build whatever you want in Scratch, this week, Alice and I are going to show you some techniques to keep your code clean and a little bit about how to debug your program. Then, we'll show you some example projects that use many of the techniques we have discussed. Open up another browser window and log into Scratch so that you can follow along. Have fun and let's start coding! Before you can even start debugging your program, you need to have good code that is going to be easy to read, otherwise you'll never be able to figure out where the bugs are in your code. So you want to do things like keep clean code, like right here we have you know, a hat that has nothing under in it, a custom block that doesn't have anything useful in it and it's not called from anywhere. Then over in this one we have you know, four different um, green flag hats and one of them doesn't have anything in it. We have this if test off here that doesn't do anything. And then another when this sprite clicked here and it moved 10 steps. There's just a lot of scattered code all over the place that a lot of it doesn't do anything and it's really hard to tell what's going on. The variable names in this code are really weird. So here we have global one, local one, local two, thing three. None of these are very descriptive. You always want to use variable names that mean something. So if it's the score, the variable name should be something like score. The other thing in this one is it's hard to tell what's local and what's global. If I go back to the stage to show you just the global variables, you can see here they're local one, local two, thing three, and having those have local in the name makes them very hard to understand. And then back on here, you know, there's a global variable that is specific to this sprite, which is also a bad naming convention. And then the sprite itself also has bad naming. For example, it's named Thing. If I go and look at the costumes, it's named Dog and Arm. Well, clearly this is a cat, not a dog. It has an arm, but it doesn't make any sense that the sprite would be, or the costume would be called Arm. So you want to make sure that you're naming things properly in your code. If you look at the code for the Scratch Cat, he has one, two, three, four green flags in his scripts. And one of them says move 10 steps and one of them says move 20 steps. Well, with the way Scratch works, you don't know which one of those is going to happen. So if you have code that has two different hats of the same type and they do two different things, you're never going to be able to tell which one is going to happen. Um, and it can even kind of randomly choose between the two. So you never want to do that. If you have multiple hats in there that are the same type, you want to make sure that they're doing different things that make sense for them to be doing. This is the code for the uh, left player paddle in the ping pong game that I programmed. And as you can see, it's a lot easier to read than the other code that we had on there. First of all, there's comments that kind of say what each section is doing. And... Also, you know, there's not a lot of extraneous code laying around that isn't being used. One of the things I did here is um, there's several variables, running, winner, that are used in here. And those are all global variables because one of the practices I like to use is anything that's a global variable, I make it all capital letters. If it's a local variable, I make it all lowercase letters. So, but this is, you know, a pretty good example of some cleaner code than what you saw on the other uh, screen that I was showing. Two of the things I want to point out in here are first of all my green arrow clicked. Um, this code what it does is just basically resets reinitializes everything in in the left player paddle to be where I want it to be when the game starts. So you know it goes to its normal costume it makes sure it's showing it points in the proper direction and it goes to basically the middle of the screen. Those are all the things I want to happen when it starts. I see still in class a lot of times when you guys are making games and, or whatever, your every time you click the green arrow button, you move everything into position by hand first. And really you should be doing something like this or when you cl click the green arrow button, it moves into place for you. The other thing is that when you're writing comments, um, it's okay to have something like this that says move down when S is pressed. It's kind of obvious if you know Scratch that that's what's going to happen. A comment like this is a little bit better though where um, it tells you what's happening and it tells you why it's happening. You, you really want your, um, your, co your comments in your code to tell you why things happen, not what happens. Because if you just say, you know, change the speed by five, well, 
okay, you're changing it by five, but why is that happening? That's the important part where somebody else coming back to look at your code or remix your code is going to want to know why you did something. Debugging programs in Scratch is a little bit different than a traditional programming language because it's mostly a visual language. A lot of the debugging winds up just being manually inspecting your sprites and your costumes and your backdrops and your code to see if there's something in it visually that is wrong. So because we need to debug our code by you know visually looking at things, I'm just going to show you some examples of some common things that can go wrong in a script. And you know this will help you look for those things in the future when you're writing your own scripts. The first technique to try is just looking at your script and making sure that the blocks are in the proper order. So for example, what if I wanted Scratch Cat here to say hello for two seconds and move a hundred steps? I click play and it looks like he's moving before he says hello. I look at my code and hey, they're out of order. Say hello is after move. So I move it up, uh, let me move it back to zero, zero. Click play, now he says hello for two seconds and then moves and that's what I was looking for. So this making sure blocks uh, are in the proper order sounds kind of simplistic, but that often winds up being a big problem. Blocks being in the wrong position is really important when you start looking at repeats or if tests or things like that because um, they can really affect your program and you know this is a real obvious example of it you know I want him to say hello for two seconds and then move 10 steps um, but because I have my say hello in the wrong spot he says hello moves 10 steps says hello moves 10 steps and that's not what I want him to do really the code should look like this say hello for two seconds and then that's much more what I'm looking for so especially when you have repeats and if tests and stuff like that just make sure that um, you, you have the stuff you want in your repeat or in your if test in there and the stuff that you don't want out of it. Another real common but real simplistic problem is using the wrong block altogether. So for in this, this example, I want Scratch Cat to loop through and say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's pretty easy. So I have a looper variable and I set it to 1 and then I repeat 10 times and I go through and I increment looper every time. The problem is, he's always saying one. And if you look at my code here, I have set looper to one, when really what I want is change looper by one. So that looper becomes, goes up higher and higher every time through. Now if I play it one, two, three, four, he counts all the way through. So again, this is a real simplistic problem, but it's something that, that can really become a pain uh, if, you, if you're not sure what to look for. This can become a real problem for you if you're using a repeat until or a wait until or even an if test that relies on that variable to change. So right here I have it repeat until looper equals 11. And when I you know, write my code here, uh, Scratch Cat is saying one over and over and over again. And now he's never ever stopping. But if you can see the script is still running. This is what they call an infinite loop. Because looper never gets to 11, it's never going to stop. So I need to stop it and I need to change this set to be a change by again. So now it's set to change looper by one. Now he's going to count up and when it hits 11, he'll stop. The other big problem people have with these repeat until type of loops is they just leave anything out altogether that would change that variable. And you know, this is again, it just causes an infinite loop where it's never going to stop saying one because looper never increases. And just make sure if you have a repeat until you have something in there that's going to change the variable that's going to stop your script. Another common problem that you can have with a scratch program is, for example, on my uh, ping pong game, I have a left player and a right player. And when I was first programming it, um, I programmed left player and then I copied I, I did a duplicate on this and that copied all the scripts and everything over to right player. And then I was having problems with my code and I couldn't figure out why. And it's because right down here, um, I have if winner equal left player and I forgot to change that. So when I finished the game, it would show both players as the winner every time. And I didn't, I didn't want that to happen. 
So I had to change this to right player and then that made it work properly. So once you start, you know, copying code between um, different sprites or between your backdrop and sprites or out of your backpack and into a sprite, you, you have to make sure of things like the variable names and any hard coded type stuff like right player that I have here um, got changed to be part of this sprite instead of some other sprite. This problem is probably something you're not going to run into as often, but it's, you know, make sure that your data is valid. So here, you know, I want Scratch Cat to say one through whatever number, and I use Looper to figure out which number that is. And up here, I'm setting Looper to a ver to um, this equation. Well, hopefully you guys know this from math class. You cannot divide by zero. 100 divided by zero is something that isn't possible. So if I run this, you know, to make Scratch more friendly, they have it say infinity, and it just keeps saying infinity over and over again. So, um, if I wasn't saying this right away, though, what would happen is, you know, I'd, I'd keep using Looper in calculations or something like that, and eventually I'd wind up with an answer that was just completely incorrect because I did this wrong calculation to begin with. So, when you start using data to do calculations, you have to make sure you're not doing weird things like dividing by zero. That just isn't mathematically possible. I already talked about this a bit when I was talking about keeping clean code, but if you have multiple hats that are the same type, so like on this example I have two green flag hats, if they're doing the exact same type of thing, so this is doing a go to and then a move, you never know which one of these is actually going to run in your code. I have a move 100 steps and a move 200 steps. And right now it looks like it's pretty reliably choosing the 100 steps one, but if I play around with these a little bit, I can probably get it to do the other one instead. So play around, play around, and see what happens now. Now he's moving 200 steps. I don't know why, I have no way to predict why. So it's best to, if you have multiple hats of the same type, make sure they do completely different types of code. That way when it runs, both of those things can run and they're not gonna conflict with each other. So the one real debugging technique that Scratch has is if you have variables and you want to be able to see what's in them, there's a couple different ways that lets you do that. So I have this code sample here where basically I'd like Scratch get to walk in a circle while he's pointed in the circle direction. So if you run it, you know, he starts here, turns that way, turns that way, turns that way, comes back up, and then, oh, wait, you know, he turned too much, and I'd like to be able to see why. Well, I'm using this looper variable as my control for um, the repeat, so let's just have him say looper every time through and see what happens. Uh, say looper. So now as the program runs, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4. Okay, so there's the problem. I'm, I'm repeating until looper equal 5, which is right if I have looper set to 1 to begin with. So now... It starts off one, two, three, four. And then when it hits five, it's already out of the loop. So that's just an example of how you can use the say to see the current value of a variable. And then when, you know, when you're done, you just take that out, put the rest of your code back, and now it runs how it's supposed to run and you don't have that extra say in there. The other technique you can use to show the variables for debugging purposes is either turn the variables on with the checkbox or use the show variable and hide variable code in your uh, scripts. And, you know, depending on what how much stuff you have going on in your uh, project and things like that, this may be better than using, say, it may be worse. It's just something you need to do and figure out what you like better. The last thing we wanted to do was show you some examples of some projects on Scratch that use you know a lot of the techniques and things that we've been talking about all through these sessions. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of games that I programmed to show you things from the coding side, and then Alice is going to show you some digital art that she found that shows you kind of the creative side of it. And she was able, you know, this is something that somebody else made, and she was able to remix it and start being even more creative by adding things to it on her own. So the first thing I wanted to show you was the uh, ping pong game that a couple of you have seen in class already. But basically, you know, if you haven't seen it yet, when I hit space, the ping pong ball bounces around, 
he either bounces off my panels and that means nobody's winning yet or he gets through and then that makes the other person the winner um this is some very simple code there's you know a couple of broadcast receive things going on there's some keyboard presses going on but really it, there's not a whole lot of complex code in here it's all very very simple to get this to work um again scratch can be pretty powerful with not a whole ton of code when you want it to be uh the other thing i wanted to make sure you note is that you know this is pretty decent well commented code variable ma names mean things there's no extraneous code sitting around so it's just a good example of some simple code that makes a fun game to play this example is a little more complex so this is a snake chasing game and i'll you know I'll click play here real quick so it puts a snake on the screen it puts an apple on the screen and the snake goes around and finds the apple and if i hit myself or if i hit a wall the game is over let me go hit myself game over and my score is how many apples I collected I collected 14 that time this game uses some of the more advanced topics that we talked about so you know I have a couple of different um, custom blocks in here one of them finds the difference between two X and Y coordinates the other one detects if the head of the snake is touching the tail of the snake because if it is then it's a game over um, and if you look, I actually do in here, is head touching tail actually calls the find distance uh, custom block. The other thing I'm doing here that's kind of advanced is I'm using lists to keep track of all the X positions and all the Y positions in the tail. And the reason I do that is when the tail draws, it's a pen drawing. And Instead of adding and subtracting from the end of the tail all the time, which could get real complicated in the code, instead, I just, um, every time through the loop where I want to draw it, I clear all the pen drawings and then redraw the entire tail at one time. And so if you look here, I have a defined draw, which has the uh, run without screen refresh, so it runs fast. And basically, it goes to every position in those two lists and draws that line between all those points. The other thing I'm doing here is if you see I have set pen to calculated color and I have a set color um, custom block in here and that's using that color calculation thing that we said to set it to a you know 34 139 34 is going to be kind of a darkish green and the reason I want to do that is in the apple um, at some point when I'm drawing the apple on the screen, I want to make sure it's not touching the current tail. And I do that by repeating until it's not touching that color. Well, I didn't want to have to make sure I was touching the exact same color with that set color. Um, uh, you know, in here, when I do this, I have to go, if I want it to be a green, I got to go and find this green and make sure it's the right shade and all that kind of stuff. I didn't want to have to worry about that. So instead I used the, the calculation and both times I set it to 34, 139, 34, 255. And in here, 34, 139, 34, 255. So they're the same. It's for sure going to be the same. I don't have to play around with um, making sure that I click the right spot in the color to make it happen. So the last game I wanted to show you is a breakout type of game. And I'll show you how it works real quick here. Um, press space to start and then aim the ball at those things the blocks at the top and then the ball keeps bouncing back and forth between the blocks and my paddle until it falls through and then my score winds up being how many blocks that I was able to knock out and if I hit space it lets me start over again and it keeps track of a high score as well. So if I beat my high score, that becomes the new high score. This is probably the most complicated program that I made that I'm going to show you. And part of the reason is, if I look at the blocks, you know, there's only one block, but a bunch of them get created. And that's because, you know, I use a bunch of looping in here to create a bunch of clones. And each of those clones gets its own ID. And then each of the clone IDs gets inserted into a list of block X and Y position so that we know the position of every one of those clones based on their clone ID. The reason that list of X and Y coordinates is, is important is because in Scratch, it's 
easier to bounce off of a sprite than it is to bounce off of a clone. So we keep the list of the X and Y positions. And then in the block, when we detect that um, the ball is touching the current clone, it broadcasts something that says bounce off block. And then over in ball, where we have bounce off block, we have this thing that says bounce off sprite, which is a custom block where we give it a sprite name. But because I can't give it a clone name or a clone number or anything like that, instead, I do another broadcast that says move to block clone position. And I have an extra sprite here called block bounce. And in here, when it receives moves to blo move to block clone position, it goes to that particular X, Y. And then over in here, in this custom block that I wrote, when it needs to point towards a sprite, it can point towards this thing. It's something that we never see on the screen, but it's vital to make the ball bounce off of the current uh, clone because it can't bounce off of the sprite because that isn't actually being used. The clone is being used. There's a lot of code here in all three of these programs, and you don't want me to sit here and go through them all line by line. That would be super boring. Instead, you should open up the projects, remix them, and start playing around with them. I tried to comment the code as much as possible. I used good coding techniques. You know, all my global variables are capital letters. My local variables are lowercase letters. And um, anytime I use the broadcast or anything, I tried to name it something that is obvious. So you should be able to follow these projects pretty easily and tell what's going on with them. And then we can also talk about them in class a little bit if you want, if you don't understand any of the code that's going on. But really, I'd prefer you remix them and start playing around with them and do some creative stuff. This project by Rosita is a great example of digital art you can create in Scratch. This is what the project does. So you can see we have a box and a butterfly appearing. For example, this girl is drawn all in vector in Scratch's vector editing tools, so they are very powerful. She has several different costumes for the girl's face, so it looks like her hair is blowing in the wind and it's making the girl blink. In the code for the girl's face, she switches between costumes to make it look like her hair is blowing or blinking. Another really cool example is the box around the butterfly. As you can see, the only costume for the box is a small dot. That is because the entire thing is drawn using Scratch's pen drawing tools with code to create it. You can see in the code that there's a render custom block that is used to make it look like it's rota rotating. The render block is set up so that it draws without screen refresh, like we talked about. So I'm going to show you, see it says run without screen refresh. This is because they want the animation to look smooth and not have all those small pauses we talked about. I'm going to show you what it looks like without the run without screen refresh. So as you can see the block is getting drawn instead of just sitting there and look every second she comes in a little slower than she did before and i'm going to show you again what it looks like with the screen refresh just to uh prove like that uh it has a major difference on it so it's going a little bit faster than it did before without the screen refresh. And as you can see, the cube, instead of fading out and then fading back in and fading back out, it turns very nice. And so that is why this is, this is a good example of how you can create any type of digital art you want in Scratch. 
So like Alice said, that Wish Upon a Butterfly project that she was showing you is not something she made. It was made by this person called Rosita. Alice just thought it was really cool and a good example of digital art, so she wanted to show it to you. Um, but I'll take her, I'll take the code from Rosita and remix it and then share it out with you guys so you can go in and see it. And I'll show you how to get to the original code if you want to remix the original code for some reason, reason as well. Um, and then you can look at the costumes in there, which are really cool because she draws them all by hand in scratch. And then also the code that lets some of that stuff happen that Alice was showing you. Those projects just touch the surface of what you can do with Scratch. You can build almost anything that your imagination can create. That's it for this week of Code Club and this set of videos. We hope you enjoyed them. Now go do some coding, be creative, and have fun.